So Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do today is to start with the introduction, a very general introduction to the topic of hematolysis transitions. Um, and just basically give some general ideas and then we'll go from there. So uh, I guess I should now try to share the screen, all right? Yes. So let's see how that works. Uh, that's not, I, I, uh, so I've shared the screen, I should, Yes, I can share my keynote presentation. Yeah. So this, does it look good to you guys? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. good. So this is, now you can see the, the screen. So thank you very much for having me uh, uh, give this presentation. And I would like to give a very, very, very general introduction to the topic of metal and sweat transitions, which is probably one of the, a basic science problems in solid state physics. It goes back to the, to the early days of solid state physics, but uh, the activity has been going up and down. And very recently there is a renew, renewal of interest. Part of it is sparked by this uh, excellent collaboration entitled the MUST, which is providing uh, first principle modeling for systems with disorder and correlations. But also there is a lot of experimental advances that are now attracting renewed attention uh, to this topic. And so today I will actually show you some very recent uh, data that are very closely related to what we've been discussing in this group uh, concerning more materials, very exciting stuff. Uh, but let me start from the very beginning and, and just define what I mean by the metal and soil transition. Before I do this, uh, uh, let me just say that uh, I've, uh, I'll, I'll be focusing mostly on the work that I've been doing with very with a very large number of collaborators over the years. And I may not be giving proper reference to all kinds of people who contribute to this gigantic topic. So I cannot hope in this lecture or series of lectures to give proper credit to everyone, but let me just give you some references to my own work. Here, there is a review article we wrote some 15 years ago on disorder in quality systems. And also this monograph where various people contributed review articles, it's uh, almost 10 years old, but it has a lot of information. So I'll give some other references as we go along, but I will not be listing collaborators uh, at the beginning at this moment, because there is a large number of them, too many to, to, uh, to, uh, to discuss right now. So uh, the metal and soil transition is uh, a very old problem. And it is very well defined only at low temperature, at zero temperature, because only at zero temperature, there is a clear difference between an insulator and a metal. At finite temperature, even an insulator will display some poor but finite conductivity and the metal does uh, the same. So if you want to really distinguish them, what you have to do is to go to lower and lower temperatures. And precisely at zero temperature, there is a sharp distinction because either you are conducting or you're not. And so this transition is uh, often viewed as a zero temperature transition driven by uh, some kind of quantum fluctuations, which you can increase in a system, giving more kinetic energy to the system by applying various perturbations like pressure, electrostatic fields, magnetic fields, and so forth. Um, however, uh, at low temperature, these two states or phases of matters are very uh, clearly distinguished, and there is a very sharp transition at zero temperature. But at finite temperature, there is an intermediate regime above some crossover temperature scales, which is very complicated and controversial. And that uh, still remains to be explained and understood fully. And it has been a subject, a lot of controversy over the years. So this is the region that we want to focus on, the region between a metal and an insulator and how we go from one to the other at finite temperatures. Now I wanna mention an important point is that uh, a classical standard view of solid state physics is that we have conductors or insulators depending on the, on the filling of the, of the bands. And by changing the symmetry of the material by uh, various forms of charge order, spin order, orbital order, we can change the symmetry and then the band structure will rearrange and we can have metal and square transitions driven by that. Now, what I wanna talk about here is what can happen in absence of this. So if the metal and this will have the same symmetry no doubling of the unit cell, then in many cases there can be a sharp transition, but it's not driven by the symmetry changes. And this is a particularly 
challenging topic because uh, for many years of work, we already understand how to deal with symmetry changes, but this uh, transition which doesn't involve symmetry is particularly challenging. So if you ignore the symmetry changes, then basically two basic mechanisms have been put forward as candidates to stop the motion of the electrons. One is the strong interactions uh, that Mott uh, started to think about early on, strong repulsion that uh, stops the electrons from moving. But Anderson pointed out that also impurities, uh, the electrons can form bound states with impurities. And that's another way to stop the motion. Probably in most systems are, you have both of them. But what is really confusing is whether these two mechanisms help each other, uh, fight each other, which one is dominant in what class of systems. And uh, most importantly, uh, I think the art of theoretical physics consists of, of determining what is the main mechanism for something and then treating the rest as perturbations. So the big question in this field is, should we treat the disorder as the main, uh, as the main mechanism and treat the interactions as a small correction and perturbation or vice versa? This uh, question is particularly important because at this moment, we have a pretty good understanding of the effects of disorder without interactions, the so-called Anderson localization. But the uh, topic of interaction-driven transitions is much more difficult and much more challenging even at this time. So uh, it's, I think, very important to appreciate whether interactions are playing a big role uh, or not. So uh, just let me mention a few strategies that theorists have used to approach this type of uh, problem. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, phase transitions are usually typically associated with a change of symmetry. And Landau taught us how to deal with this using another parameter description. And then uh, typically uh, one can get a simple Landau theory in high dimensions and provide and, and create uh, corrections to this mean field theory performing uh, an expansion above the upper critical dimension. And this strategy has worked really well for many standard phase transitions. For the mental and square transition, uh, we are focusing on problems which do not feature a symmetry change, a static symmetry being broken. And so it's not even clear whether there is an upper critical dimension. This, this uh, time honored strategy is not available to us. And then what people resorted to uh, some 30 years ago and later is to take a different strategy is to approach the problem from the uh, from low dimensions where even relatively weak disorder can uh, have big effects. And looking at the stability of metals, uh, fermi liquids, two very small perturbations due to disorder. So this is something that uh, the so-called gang of four scaling theory localization first started. And then it was extended to uh, interacting systems by Sasha Finkelstein and many followers and basically this approach comes from low dimensions uh, and expands around low dimensions. This, pro this uh, uh, type of approach is formally very beautiful. It can involve some very sophisticated formalism called the nonlinear sigma model. And it seems very powerful, but in practice it has been all but powerful. In fact, apparently it has not explained a single experiment. It has not been successful at all. Later, some more general studies in statistical mechanics reveal that general expansions from low dimensions are not well behaved and have all kinds of problems. But I vividly remember uh, what happened to me in my life. I, my first postdoc was at University of Maryland. I worked on Finkelstein theory with Ted Kirkpatrick and Dietrich Bellitz. But then my second postdoc was at Rutgers. When I got to Rutgers, Gabby Kotler told me, well, Vlad, you know, there's a big problem with this type of approach. And the big problem is that in real life, in many materials, there are strong interactions and uh, mod physics. And this type of approach is assumed that you're starting with a Fermi liquid, putting disorder in a Fermi liquid. It just cannot describe strong interactions in mod physics, and that could be a serious problem. So this has actually a big influence on me. And in fact, perhaps this is the reason why these kind of approaches, which formally are very beautiful, have not been successful almost at all. So, um, the first question you can think about is, well, we have some decent understanding of, of, of strong disorder. In many systems are really strongly disordered. This is one of the topics of this project that we are uh, discussing here in this group. And so if we understand the uh, disorder relatively well, strong disorder, can we, could, can we add interactions as a small perturbation? Is this a good starting point or not? So in the next couple of minutes, I would like to show you some evidence that this is actually not so. 
And then in fact, the opposite approach, uh, which starts from strong interactions and as disorder is perhaps a better starting point. And so we need to think about how to properly treat interactions that this is almost an indispensable uh, strategy in trying to be successful in this field. So uh, let's start from the beginning and think about what, what we know about metals. When we add, uh, when we raise temperature, uh, the resistivity increases due to various forms of scattering. Uh, at low temperatures, you can have electron electron interactions. At room temperature, typically metals are dominated by phonons, and that's pretty well understood. And what happens when we add disorder? Well, generally, disorder gives you some uh, impurity scattering at low temperature. And in good metals like uh, copper and gold, you have few, a few impurities, the correlations are weak. Uh, the uh, disorder is also pretty weak. And so these two different forms of scattering, they pretty much can be considered just as additive because they're weak. And Matthiasen, in the early days of solid physics, formulated Matthiasen's rule saying that basically the scattering rate from different sources simply add up when the scattering is weak. And that means that these curves will simply be shifted uh, up and down with respect to each other. So that when you add disorder, the residual resistivity will go up and the entire curve will shift up. And in fact, this is what you find in moderately uh, disordered metals. So this is a famous rule, but uh, uh, the first clue that something is much more complicated is seen when we people start to study uh, adding systematically stronger and stronger disorder. And this has been done uh, uh, in the late 70s and in the uh, early 80s by uh, systematic ways like uh, ion, heavy ion irradiation or, or, or heavy uh, or high energy X-ray irradiation. So typically what you get is the, uh, is the, is the curve on the, on the left uh, or the plot on the left, which shows what happens to a good metal. This was some uh, A15 compound, which was a standard metal in absence of, or with weak disorder. You can see the bottom curve. I'm actually not sure how to use the mouse in this presentation. Is it possible to use the mouse or not? Mouse. Bottom okay. left corner, uh, you can choose a laser pointer. Yeah, use an annotator. On the annotator, you can see it. Uh, oops. Okay, annotate. Okay, I see. Uh, so it's through the pointer, yeah. Or you can use pointer. Oh. Yeah, there's a, you can see pointer. Eraser, spotlight. Spotlight, it? yeah, spotlight, yeah. Could you? I don't actually see it. Do you see it? The laser pointer. I don't. I don't actually see this. Well, something is wrong. I, I never mind. Let me continue without it. Uh, so uh, you see a series of curves that are obtained by starting from a good metal and increasing the disorder. You can see the residual resistivity on the left increasing uh, and getting higher and higher. And um, but at the same time, we also see the Matthiasen's rule, which says that. The residual resistivity should simply add to the temperature dependent term coming from phonons. Uh, that this is uh, completely starting to break down once the disorder is sufficiently large. And uh, the residual resistivity is going up, the slope is actually decreasing. And uh, at some point, uh, we find a curve which has a zero slope. I'll try to see if, I don't know what's. This is really annoying me that I cannot use the mouse here. Uh, oops. So, so I'll annotate spotlight. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Well, we can see it now. But I, but, but. Uh -huh. But the the uh, full screen, the full screen is not working now. It's so okay. Then, now I still see, don't see the mouse. Mouse. That's really really annoying. Anyway, let me continue. Uh, so um, so we can see that the Matthiasen's rule is breaking down, and we find a very characteristic behavior that. The zero temperature resistivity, the intercept and the slope are correlated with each other. 
And basically, as you can see on this uh, a little plot on the right-hand side, the uh, slope A is a linear function of the residual resistivity rho zero. And this is seen actually in many, many systems. So this linear dependence between the intercept and the slope, where the slope changes sign, has been documented first by Hans Mui in the, in the 70s. And um, what he noted is something remarkable, that the flat curve is in fact exactly where uh, we hit the so-called Mott limit, Mott Yoffer regular limit, which is given by the notion that the mean free path becomes on the comparable to the atomic line scales or the Fermi momentum times the mean free path is something of order one. So basically uh, you have something that uh, tells you that the, the typical metallic behavior breaks down when you have hit this mod limit and uh, then the slope of the resistivity changes sign. It looks more like an insulator, but it still has finer residual resistivity at low temperatures. I wanted to mention that uh, the, the, the graph that you see in the middle is obtained not on these uh, uh, three-dimensional metals which were irradiated, but actually on a specific uh, moiré system that uh, has been fabricated only this summer, uh, where they actually have a band gap they can close and they have a, a transition which seems to be disorder driven. This is not in the MOT regime, but looks very, very similar to these other systems. So, as, as time is advancing, then people are actually developing more and more examples of such behavior. And uh, this is actually has uh, been a longstanding problem. Uh, when I was a graduate student, one of my favorite uh, papers was the famous review article by Leon Krishnan written in 1985 on disordered electronic systems. I'm sure everyone in this community is familiar with it. And if you go to the end of this paper, there is a, a section entitled Remarks in Open Problems. And one of them, the first one is these high so-called high temperature anomalies given by this Moy uh, discovery. So this has re uh, remained an open question. And very recently I returned to this problem but I'm not gonna talk much about this today. I just wanted to mention that this is something that's very difficult or completely impossible to understand using standard uh, picture of Anderson localization. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, tell you that this is not an exception. This table that was created by my collaborator Simone Fertini is a list of all, all materials where this has been observed and documented. So this is a very common uh, occurrence uh, in disorder systems, but this is actually not part of the metal and solar transition itself. It happens in sufficiently disordered metals still some distance away from the metal and solar transition. And this is actually an important message because uh, usually the metal and solar transitions or phase transitions are describing, described by using some scaling description. This is outside that regime. And this is also a challenge. How can we actually think of this? A second experimental puzzle that has been well-documented in strongly disordered sort of systems is the fact that uh, if you extrapolate or measure the conductivity at very low temperature, and then uh, you vary some control parameter like the doping concentration to uh, tune yourself to the transition, you find that in many, many systems, the conductivity vanishes, approaches zero uh, linearly and very linearly in a very large range of concentrations. So please have a look actually at uh, these two examples. One is compensated silicon, phosphor, and, uh, and boron. Uh, and the other one is amorphous niobium silicon. In both cases, you see this beautiful linear dependence, uh, which extends actually very far from the transition. So there are two things I would like to mention that gives us hints as to what is important in building a theory. The first thing is that this is really very well nicely documented linear behavior. So the a conductivity exponent is one. Uh, such integer exponents are typical of mean field theories, but an even more important hint is given if you, if you compare this result to the predictions of the non-interacting model. So there are two non-interacting models of disorder driven transitions. One is quantum Anderson localization where the exponent should be 1.6. So the conductivity should be approaching zero with zero slope um, indicated by the dashed line on the left panel. Uh, percolation will give you an even larger exponent too, also with zero slope. You can see very clearly that this is not working. You have to be blind not to appreciate that Anderson localization or percolation 
are completely failing in explaining these experiments. So the only possibility is that interactions are doing something rather dramatic. And we have to come to grips with the ways to treat the interactions in a non-trivial fashion. Another uh, clue that this is uh, true is obtained by a very recent uh, series of studies that were focusing on imaging of disordered materials. And there are many examples that recently have been looked at by various groups. But one thing that I found fascinating and in common in many of these strongly disordered materials, you find that as you approach the transition, not only that the conductivity uh, decreases to over zero, but uh, a gap opens in a tunneling density of states. You see several examples here that this kind of pseudo, so this is a per, this is basically close to the critical point, close to the metal and solar transition. You see clearly some sort of V-shaped pseudo gap um, forming at the transition. And I would like to stress that this is exactly what we do not expect based on Anderson localization alone. Anderson localization says we can form bound states, but it does not provide any mechanism for gap opening. Gap opening is usually associated with some interaction effects. And so this is another very important clue that interactions must play a very, very big role. And so uh, it basically is teaching us that we need to develop a way of thinking that can treat interactions properly. And only then we'll be able to treat the disorder problems uh, in, in an appropriate fashion. So we are back to Mott. And so perhaps a better strategy rather than immediately jumping to think about disordered systems and strongly disordered systems, we should actually perhaps study systems where interactions dominate and see whether we can understand those systems reasonably well uh, by, by then adding moderate disorder and trying to see whether interactions with uh, which are strong and disorder which is weak can provide us a good description of a certain family of systems. And then we can go on from there to ask what happens when stronger disorder is added as well. So uh, what I would like to uh, mention at this point is that uh, there are a remarkable experimental developments in the last 20 years concerning uh, systems that can be understood as examples of a mod transition uh, driven by strong correlations. Uh, of course, the, mod, the idea of MOT systems is, goes back to the 50s and the early ideas of MOT and Hubbard, also Phil Anderson contributed to this significantly. And they were thinking about systems like oxides, like high PC cuprates, which were discovered later. But um, these systems are actually in many cases dominated by all kinds of orders, anti-ferromagnetic order, charge order. And they're very, very complicated. They have very complicated band structure. And also they're very difficult to tune through the transition. Often is done by chemical doping, but that introduces also some material problems. And so these are not really very nice systems to study the mod transitions on its own. Uh, in the recent 20, I'd say 25 years, uh, several examples have been uh, discovered where uh, we can actually have a much simpler electronic structure where we can actually have a great deal of control over this band structure and other parameters characterizing the system. So we can actually study the mod type, uh, uh, mod type metal and solar transition in great detail. Perhaps the first example was given by the 2D electron gas in silicon. These are the famous MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, which are actually a basis of modern electronics and they are typically used at room temperature. But Kravchenko, I guess, was the first one to uh, get hold of some extremely high mobility samples with very weak disorder and then went to really low temperatures and we found a remarkably sharp metal and solar transition as you change the electron density in this 2D layer, which can be accomplished by this uh, so-called gate, electrostatic gating method. Uh, and uh, you obtain the family of curves. Uh, these curves shown here are actually due to Vladimir Pudalov, his former, uh, Korchenko's former mentor where we can actually see uh, some metallic curves with resistivity maxima, and then at lower density, some insulating curves uh, uh, have a very characteristic shape, uh, uh, which seems to evolve uh, very steadily as we go through, as came through the transition. Another set of systems which were displaying very similar behavior or became the focus of work done 
in the 2000s, Canoda discovered that a certain type of charge transfer salts, where molecules form a triangular uh, lattices in, in 2D planes, so it's a quasi 2D material, is apparently very well represented by a, a single band Hubbard model uh, at half filling on a triangular lattice. And uh, in a certain number of, of such uh, materials, they were able to show that magnetic order doesn't in fact uh, appear even on the insulating side of the metal insulator transition. So this is, a transi this is a system, these are systems where uh, the symmetry is not changed. There is no magnetism to interfere and to complicate things. And by applying pressure on these very soft materials, you can tune through the metal insulator transition starting from an insulator, closing the mud gap and then uh, observing metallic behavior. This is shown at the middle panel below. And you see again, a curves rather similar to those in the 2D electron gas with very characteristic resistivity maxima on the metallic side that become uh, less and less pronounced as we, uh, as we go further uh, to the metallic side. Very recently, uh, people have discovered another class of fascinating materials, which are made of bilayers of transition metal dichalcogenides. In this case, I'm showing some results on uh, tungsten uh, selenium-2 and molybdenum tellurium 2 by Gia Shan at Cornell. Uh, this particular material, uh, this, this class of materials has these two layers, which are slightly mismatched in the light spacing or in the angle, or in the, they are slightly rotated with respect to each other. And so you get a superstructure which again forms a very narrow band at the Fermi energy with which uh, is shown to uh, represent very well a triangular um, a Hubbard model and a triangular lattice. I wanna mention that uh, these TMDs are actually excellent examples of Hubbard mod physics in contrast to uh, the class of systems that were discovered first uh, about two years ago uh, on graphene bilayers, which are not so well represented by a Hubbard model, much more complicated, have some topological features, but these uh, TMD uh, bilayer, bilayers are actually shown to be excellent examples of, of a mod system on a triangle lattice. And indeed, remarkably, this uh, preprint came out just a couple of days ago with a panel on the lower right. And you see a family of curves whereby applying an electric field they can uh, tune the band structure to go through the mod transition and half filling. And you can see that this family of curves is almost identical to those obtained on organic charge transfer salts. So uh, we have here some really beautiful examples of, um, of uh, uh, that give us the possibility to study the mod transition uh, very, very carefully. And it seems that there are really robust experimental features that are observed in these materials. Of course, disorder is found here, it is not completely negligible, but uh, as it happens, and as I'll, I'll explain later, uh, maybe uh, uh, in the next presentation, then uh, many aspects of, this, of, of these experiments can be understood through a clean Hubbard model with very small or moderate uh, uh, corrections due to disorder. So what does really happen at the mod transition? The mod transition is a source of a lot of confusion. And early on people associated, Slater associated it with magnetic order because indeed in many oxides, mod insulators are magnetically ordered at low temperature. But Anderson and Mott, Hubbard and many other people pointed out that this magnetic order is usually confined to very low temperatures, but the insulating nature is not. Uh, typically magnetic order is confined to one or 200 Kelvin. Uh, uh, the mod gap can be many thousands of Kelvins wide. And so these two uh, phenomena are probably not related, uh, but the controversy continued to this date. Uh, more recently in materials such as these uh, 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 mod organic systems and also these more TMDs, it becomes clear through careful experimentation that there is no magnetic order uh, but yet you do observe, observe a sharp mod transition. So how do we think of this mod transition in absence of magnetic order? Well, uh, a mental picture can, given, can be uh, obtained by taking a look at this photograph, which was taken about 20 years ago during a turmoil in my home country of Yugoslavia, where there was some sort of uprising against the government and up to a million people came to the streets. Now, uh, 
imagine that you're in the middle of this crowd and you try to make your way, you're hungry, you have to go to the bathroom or to buy a sandwich, you want to go home, but you can't because there are people all around you. And this is sort of a traffic jam of people. Well, in the same, very much the same way, people often say that the mod transition is a traffic jam of quantum electrons. And we have to find a good way to uh, simply develop a mental picture of how this happens and to describe it mathematically. So um, before I go into uh, details, um, let me just now uh, give you a, a, a brief overview of the fact that this uh, mod transition at half filling as we tune the bandwidth and temperature has actually many uh, very different regimes. And what I would like to emphasize for the purpose of this presentation and this group is the fact that these regimes have very different physical character and they also uh, respond to disorder very differently. So if you ask the question, how is disorder affecting the mod transition? It's difficult to provide a clean answer. But if you ask yourself a question, what is disorder uh, doing to a particular regime around the mod transition? Then there is a clearer question. Uh, not all these regimes are equally sensitive to disorder. And this is something that we are starting to under understand relatively well in these systems, which are well described by mod physics. So over here, this is kind of a sort of a chart or map of, of, what, uh, of what I'll be talking about further on. Uh, so I want to kind of explain that you see on the, when you look at this phase diagram, this is from our 2013 paper on the Wyndham line. I think Anya was a, a, an author on this paper. You see on the left bottom at low temperature and for on the metallic side, you have a, a well-developed Fermi liquid. And this Fermi liquid is just as good as any Fermi liquid. And so if you put a particles in a Fermi liquid and a good metal, the perturbation can propagate at two large distances. You observe fiddle oscillations, you observe coherent waves propagating, you can have interference of these waves and people study this a great deal. So this is one regime where disorder can have a rather pronounced and, and well-documented effects. But correlations can affect this, and I'll be describing to you how this changes as we actually approach the mod transition, uh, which apparently creates a big uh, difference to these interference processes. Uh, a very slightly different regime is obtained when we raise the temperature from the metallic side, and then there is a well-defined temperature, which is often called the brinkman rice line, where these metallic quasi-particles are thermally destroyed. And then uh, the system displays well-pronounced resistivity maxima shown on the panel on the left. There is some effect of disorder on this regime, but it is actually much weaker, or rather moderate. And then as we go further uh, towards the insulating side, at high temperature, we find this quantum critical regime, which shows beautiful um, resistivity scaling. You can measure or calculate theoretically a family of resistivity curves and uh, demonstrate the day of base scaling. This was first predicted in, by, in, uh, uh, by Anya Teletska or Hannah Teletska, some people call her Hannah, some people call her Anya in her PhD thesis. And later in 2015, it was beautifully confirmed by a Canoda's experiment and that of many other people. But this regime again, uh, seems to be very weakly affected by disorder. Canoda claims that uh, adding sufficient disorder can broaden this regime and extend it all the way to zero temperature without at all modifying the scaling properties. I, I'm not so convinced that this is correct. Other people like Martin Dressel are now studying experiments where they'll be adding disorder systematically by uh, irradiation to these materials. And that will be studied further in the years to come. But the effect of disorder is moderate. If we go further to the, to the uh, insulating side, to the right of this phase diagram and lower temperatures, we open a mod gap. This regime uh, is rather robust to all perturbations because we have gaps which are very substantial and large. And one of the main effects of disorder in this regime is the fact that you can uh, broaden the Hubbard bands by disorder. And in some cases, sufficient disorder can in fact close the mod gap and make the system into a moderate conductor. 
a moderately good conductor. So this is not a very strong effect. And in fact, it's rather easy to, uh, to, uh, to understand. It has also been observed in some experiments by Canode and others. But perhaps the most interesting regime is the one found in the middle at low temperatures around the transition itself, where according to the DMFT picture and according to experiments on the materials I've shown you, there, uh, there is a phase coexistence region between metal, the metal and an insulator. And then uh, adding very few impurities can favor one phase or another. And you find extremely inhomogeneous uh, situation where, where metallic and insulating domains are coexisting as shown in this diagram in, at the bottom. Uh, this diagram is in fact a large scale simulation done by one of my former students just published recently. Uh, but uh, very recently we also have results of experiments done by Martin Dressel uh, where uh, myself and, and my students are also involved where they actually find very spectacular dielectric response in this regime which we are able to fully understand uh, uh, through our DMFT theory. So, these are different regimes around the mild transition. I will discuss some of them in great, in, in, in much more detail as we go further. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just first say a couple of words about the methods that we all are using and that everyone is using also in this, in this group. So dynamical mean field theory has, has a, uh, a long history. It's been developed almost 30 years ago, but what is probably not known to many people is that in fact, it offers a very local perspective. Uh, it starts from the idea, in fact, going back to Phil Anderson in his 1958 paper on Anderson localization. We ask the question, if we pay, put a particle in a quantum state, then we should ask, what is the escape rate from this site? And it's given through a Fermi's golden rule by the matrix element squared times the density of final states. What's specific to DMFT is that it allows the environment of a given site is self consistently rearranged. And therefore the skip rate can be either zero or finite depending on what is the spectrum of electronic states in the immediate surrounding of a given site. So this local perspective was uh, something that Anderson has been pushing for throughout his lifetime. In fact, he spoke about this in his Nobel Prize lecture. And it's very different from the perspective, the momentum space perspective of Bloch that was so popular in solid state physics. Um, Gabby Kotliar, who was a student of Phil Anderson and who was one of the uh, developers of DMFT together with Paul Hart uh, and, and others, uh, was I think quite in, 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 in influenced by, by Phil's perspective where they, uh, Phil tried to, to state or to emphasize the, the locality, the local perspective is a very, very significant, uh, uh, gives us very significant clues when we talk about metal insular transitions. So um, now the next step is to develop some formalism to make these ideas a little bit more precise mathematically. And uh, the MFT as such has been first shown to be uh, exact in the limit where the coordination number, the number of neighbors is very large, which was noted by very heavy and complicated combinatorics by Fallhart and Metzner during the PhD thesis of, of Walter Metzner. Uh, this, uh, diagram, this combinatoric proof is rather complicated and I, I didn't like it very much when I started to learn the MFT, it, was, it looked super complicated. And I tried as a postdoc at Rutgers, which was some 25 years ago, to, uh, to find some simpler ways to develop, uh, to, to derive, re-derive for myself the MFT and to uh, also find ways how to add disorder to that picture. So um, in this paper, going back to 94, um, we uh, found some uh, specific models where deriving the MFT equations is particularly simple and elegant. And once you understand how this works, it's easier to understand also the heavy combinatorics that's, that's implied by the general proofs. So uh, this paper was entitled Strong Correlations and Disorder in D is equal to infinity and beyond. I'm very proud of this paper because um, uh, it shares the title with this cartoon uh, uh, which came out around the same time. But uh, when we submitted the paper to this rep B, uh, the editor accepted the paper, but said, we have to change the title because we cannot go beyond infinity. That doesn't make any sense. We told them that we meant by 
there is an approximation that corresponds to d is equal to infinity, but we go beyond that approximation. So corrections to the MFT. The editor didn't listen and he said, you, we cannot publish the paper this way. Then we threatened to withdraw the paper and then the editor actually accepted this and the paper was published with this title and I'm very proud of this. The reason why I'm mentioning it is because in the next couple of minutes, I'll show some formalism to, um, that actually gives you an easy way, a shortcut to learning how to derive the MFT equations and I'll be very brief and then I'll stop for today. Um, I think that was of interest to people because this is an introduction to this field. And I think it's, pro it's probably important to understand how something works in the simplest possible example. So I want to mention that DMFT, the idea of DMFT is to take a lattice and then a single out a single site. And then imagine that we can integrate out or eliminate from the partition function all sites except for one and get an effective description of dynamics on that one site. The rest is represented by some spectral function, which some people call it the cavity function delta. And the trick is to actually uh, self-consistently determine this environment. That really implements these ideas going back to Phil Anderson and to Fermi, where the spectrum of final states is what determines the escape rate. Uh, in high dimensions where DMFT is exact, uh, the uh, so-called CPA approximation, which we actually discussed today, uh, also becomes exact and it's easy to derive it systematically. Uh, what's much more challenging is to go beyond that approximation that has its own limitations. Uh, for a certain class of models with random hopping, it's actually possible to formulate some functional integral method uh, in a field theory that allows systematic loop corrections similar to those that Wilson used in his work on phase transitions. This has never been in, uh, actually implemented yet systematically, but we are now actually working on it. So that's one way to go beyond the MFT. Another very attractive way is the so-called typical medium theory, which is uh, uh, the idea of modifying the self-consistency condition slightly, uh, but that allows actually for the possibility of cluster extensions, which is what Hannah and collaborators at Louisiana have developed. And that gives another excellent possibility to approach um, strong disorder effects within this framework. So uh, uh, in this presentation, I will focus on the first part where I would like to show you some uh, systematic derivations which are becoming exact in the limit of large coordination. So now I'll be rather quick. Please interrupt me if you have any technical questions here. The details are shown in this paper and I don't want to bore you with too much math. So uh, the top line is the Hubbard model that is familiar to everyone. And we can write down formally a partition function by integrating over these Fermi fields, so-called Grassmann fields. So this is a formalism to average over disorder, which we introduce in this model through uh, uh, random site energies or random hopping. Uh, to be able to average the partition function and other free energy, people use the so-called replica trick. That's another uh, mathematical detail, which is well known. And that's what we can use in this problem as well. Now, one particular lattice where it's particularly transparent uh, how we can derive the self-consistency condition is obtained uh, by looking at the so-called beta lattice or a Cayley tree where you don't have loops, but you have a tree-like structure. The reason why this is actually very convenient and uh, why people use it to derive mean field theories for all kinds of problems in statistical physics is that uh, you can imagine integrating a given branch like the branch number one, and that creates a field on site zero. Branch number two should create the same field. And then when you integrate uh, the site zero as well, that creates a field on the side to the left and you can in this way uh, write down a self-consistency condition uh, for this cavity field. This uh, integral equation which can be written in finite dimensions, not in finite dimensions but in, uh, for the finite coordination number. Um, formally we can write this such recursion relation but it's difficult to solve uh, in general. However, uh, if we uh, go to the limit of large coordination then uh, to get uh, to keep the kinetic energy and the potential energy comparable to each other, we have to rescale the hopping element by the square root of the number of neighbors. 
And then we can expand uh, the local effective action or, or this, uh, this cavity field in powers of the hopping element. And then we arrive at basically what we try to do, which is integrate out, integrating out all sides except for one and obtaining a local description uh, of the system. This gives us a local effective action given by this formula here, which the first term is quadratic in the Fermi fields. And the information about the environment is given by the so-called cavity function, which I denoted by W over here. It also has the random site energies epsilon. And then there's a familiar Hubbard U interaction of four Fermi fields. Uh, this is an action or Hamiltonian, this is represents nothing other than a so-called Anderson impurity model, which is a model of an interacting site embedded in a metal of a given with a given spectrum. And a lot is known for such impurity models. They are powerful impurity solvers, developed uh, approximate ones, variational ones like slide boson, or exact ones like the quantum Monte Carlo CTQMC that we heard about in previous lectures here. So um, in addition to this, this recursive structure of the bed lattice gives us the self consistency condition says that this, um, this cavity field is obtained by computing the local Green's function corresponding to the given site or with the given site energy epsilon. And then you have to perform a disorder averaging. So this self consistency condition is nothing other than the fa familiar CPA condition. So in CPA, we look at a particular atom embedded in a, an effective medium. We solve this for this atom, the local Green's function of the atom. And then we average this over disorder. If you have an alloy, we perform an average weighted average over several atomic Green's functions. And then uh, this gives us the average Green's function, the disorder average Green's function gives us, uh, defines an effective medium and its self average, self energy. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, in the non-interacting limit, uh, this procedure gives you exactly the so-called CP equation. Uh, in the interacting case, we can in fact include the Hubbard mode physics and in absence of disorder, we recover the standard DMFT for the Hubbard mode. So this is one a lattice where we can, oops, it seems that, oh, what I wanted to say uh, something before I go on to the second class of models is that uh, um, you see this recursion relation that I was writing here, which is true for finite coordination. Um, if you take the leading term in the large coordination limit, you get the familiar Anderson impurity model, the cavity field, which is self averaging. So every site, every atom is sitting in the same effective medium. Uh, however, if you imagine going beyond uh, the, this leading term and keeping the terms of order one over the square root of the coordination number. So if you expand this recursion relation to the next order, then the local effective action will acquire corrections with more Fermi fields. The first term has four Fermi fields and higher order terms uh, generate, uh, have more uh, the product of N Fermi fields. But uh, even the first term you can keep, which has four, term, four Fermi fields, uh, has a very specific physical meaning. Uh, it will add up to, it will contribute to renormalizing the Hubbard U or the on-site interaction. So uh, it shows you directly that in fact, there are corrections to single side DMFT. These corrections renormalize the interaction, but sometimes they are difficult to compute. Uh, a lot of effort has been devoted in recent years to systematically uh, calculate corrections to single side DMFT, cluster extensions that Mark Gerald developed with ECA uh, in momentum space, uh, cellular DMFT of, of Cotillard in real space, um, um, cluster extensions of uh, typical medium theory developed by Hannah and others. Uh, all of these contribute to going beyond the single side approximation, but they involve quite a bit of effort and, and complication. So I think it's important to identify simple limits where we can understand things simply, not only because it's difficult to compute corrections to this simple mean field theory, but also when we want to do a realistic modeling, which is one of the uh, objectives of this group, uh, we need to 
try to see how much we can capture by the simplest possible approximation. So I think in my presentations here, I would like to focus on that and basically try to convince you that even with the simplest single side approximation, we can actually capture quite a bit of physics. Not everything, but quite a bit of physics when properly formulating the, the problem at hand. A second uh, formal approach is given by um, models where we have a hopping element. Uh, we have random hopping elements with some average, which is zero, and they have a random sign. And these are called, uh, this class of models uh, first used by Shiba in the history of alloys, um, also are known as gauge invariant models of Wagner's. And Wagner pointed out that actually some equations simplify to have random hopping elements. Why? Because random, ho random sign hopping gives you a mean free path, uh, which is basically one lattice spacing. So uh, that additional length scale, which is the mean free path is eliminated for the problem. The mathematical structure of some equations simplify and he used this to derive the sigma model description for weak localization. Uh, they are also very uh, convenient here because they allow for a particular functional integral formulation. And we can directly average over these hopping elements and you can see this uh, resulting term in the action is not quartic in these, uh, in these Fermi fields. And we can decouple it by a Gaussian transformation, the so-called Hubbard-Stoyan transformation, introducing the so-called Q fields, which are bilinear in fermions. And uh, we can formally write down uh, uh, the partition function as an integral over the Fermi fields and these new Hubbard-Stoyan Q fields. Uh, it's, it's a rather complicated uh, action, but it does simplify tremendously in the limit where, where if you go to the limit of large coordination, large dimensions, and then we can actually solve this problem, this functional integral through a saddle point approximation. And then the saddle point value of this Q field is nothing other than the average Green's function that we talked about before. And that's the basis of the CP approximation. So this, uh, saddle point solution recovers uh, the DMFT result for uh, which is exact in the large in the limit of large coordination, which describes disorder at the CPL level, but can also treat the strong correlations. Again, the quantity that you self consistently determine is the average local Green's function, which is the central mathematical object in the, the standard theory of alloys. Uh, what uh, uh, I want to also mention is that uh, this theory gives you some uh, simple single side DMFT description, but one can actually do uh, look at uh, uh, fluctuations around the saddle point to look at uh, systematic corrections to uh, DMFT theory, DMFT mean field theory. And even if you keep the, just the quadratic terms, quadratic fluctuations, Gaussian fluctuations, uh, and compute the conductivity immediately at the, uh, uh, the first correction you get are the so-called uh, couperons and diffuson modes. And you can recover the weak localization interaction corrections that are well known in metals, but they are, they are, they are uh, uh, co uh, quantum corrections beyond root theory. So this is an interesting direction for future work. And to, uh, right now with my student, uh, Yu Ting Tan, we are actually, uh, uh, implementing this uh, this uh, program on a class of models with disorder and phonons where this is technically easier and feasible. Um, so uh, I think I can stop right here for today. Um, in, the, uh, in the future, uh, I can, uh, my plan is to actually uh, present some results of, uh, of this type of formulation is specifically for mod systems with moderate disorder. And uh, I've been recently involved in collaborations with the numerous experimentalists where we try to very carefully com uh, compare the predictions of DMFT theory with some moderate disorder to experiments. And we find actually remarkable success in many, in many situations, which seem to apply not only to the, to the electron gas, but also to mod organics. And in fact, apparently to these moderate systems that have just been discovered. So uh, these graphs here show you some examples of this. I'll be describing them further, but uh, I think this is a good place to stop. And, uh, my, and my last slide for today is just, I wanna flash this. This is our 
a roadmap for studying various regimes around the mass transition, where uh, which are quite different in their physical character, but uh, which respond to disorder quite differently. And we hope to be able to understand and explain all this in a rather simple way based on single site DMFT plus moderate uh, disorder correction. So I'll stop right here and thank you very much for your attention. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll stop recording so we can just talk. <laughs> just okay. Let me stop recording. <laughs>